I would like to introduce Professor Georgios Yanagakis from the University of Malta and also a director of the Institute of Digital Games there. Professor Yanagakis' research cuts across a range of areas AI, AI and games, effective computing, evolutionary computation, and human computer interaction. The high quality of his research is shown by multiple best paper awards and numerous prestigious research grants that Professor Yanakakis has received. In addition to wearing a researcher's hat, Professor Yanakakis wears a co founder's hat. In 2018, he co founded Model AI that is aimed at providing machine learning tools for developers to enable them create games more efficiently. Among all these activities, Professor Yanakakis also finds time for outreach. For the past couple of years, he has been co-organizing Artificial Intelligence and Games Summer School. And from what we have heard, it is a hugely successful one. Um, all right, so let's, let's get to it. Um, today, I will be talking about the interrelationship between um, artificial intelligence and games, and what I call it the symbiosis of them. Um, if you pass the title of this talk from Stable Diffusion, which is a recent uh, crazy idea of generating more or less everything, image generated, in, well, AI generated images with various prompts. If you actually use Stable Diffusion, you will end up with those images that you will see throughout my presentation. So. This is how stable diffusion thinks of symb symbiosis of AI and games. So, but uh, before moving into the details of that relationship, a few more words about uh, what I do and what I've been doing over the last 15 or so years. I have been investigating the area of AI and games, um, the intersection eventually between uh, the field and the domain. And uh, I've been writing books about it, organizing training seminars and so on. Uh, and currently I'm a professor and director of the Institute of Digital Games at the University of Malta uh, in the middle of, of the Mediterranean, a beautiful uh, island, small yet beautiful, where I also direct um, the research department of Model AI, which is um, a company dedicated to algorithms that they, they test uh, games in automatic fashion. So, yeah, that's me, uh, briefly, and uh, this is what I will be talking about today, the relationship between games and AI, um, and the ways games have been helping the advancement of the whole field of artificial intelligence, more or less ever since its birth, but also I would like to focus on the ways AI has been helping games, their design and development. Now, if you think about it, when it comes to the first sort of loop, the first connection uh, from games to AI, uh, games is a medium out there that is played by most humans on this planet. M more than half of us actually play games nowadays on a daily basis. So we leave a lot of data, we leave a lot of data, a lot of demonstrations for AI algorithms to deal with. So you can think of games as possibly the largest human behavior experiment that is taking place you know, in humanity's history, more or less, right? On the other end, AI have been advanced in games. And um, it, we, we, we all experience nowadays this sort of fourth industrial revolution with AI being the center of it, um, arguably because games are also experiencing a revolution. So once more, there's this interesting symbiotic relationship between the two that helps both games and artificial intelligence to advance. So this is what this talk is, is about. And uh, because I, I have a preference for definitions and because we talk about AI and games, let, let us define the domain. What is artificial intelligence and games? And then myself and Julian, when we called through this uh, textbook, um, we came up with this definition. It is a study of making computers able to do things which currently only humans can do in games, which naturally brings us to the question, what do humans do in games, right? And if we had time and if, the, if this was a live audience and everything, we, you know, I could ask you, what do humans do in games? And often I get like 1000 different responses, very creative responses, but for the purposes of, you know, for the time constraints that we are here and for the purposes of this presentation, I clustered all these possible responses to the following three, starting with play. Obviously we play while we're 
you know, this is this is the most the most dominant thing we do with games. We actually play them. So you could think of algorithms that they actually try to play games. And then if you think of AI that plays games, then you need to go back to back to you know go back in history like 70 years back, back in uh 1950s, where um Alan Turing here basically uh introduces to variants of min max tree and tree search all the way to nowadays StarCraft and uh, alpha star algorithm developed by DeepMind, which manages to master the game and beat any other human on the planet, right? So in between, you see various milestones of artificial intelligence that is deeply associated with games. If you visit any Wikipedia article nowadays about artificial intelligence, you will soon notice that most of the milestones of artificial intelligence, the key milestones of artificial intelligence are associated with games. I can just mention uh, algorithms like tree search, Monte Carlo tree search, multi-agent systems, deep QN, deep reinforcement learning, multi-agent deep reinforcement learning, and so on. The list is endless. Most of these algorithms have been developed within games with the purpose of beating every human that is out there, with the purpose of being super human intelligent, right? And, and that's wonderful because here we are today, we have been developing fantastic algorithms through games. And the reason that there are many reasons why games actually are so popular for AI algorithms, two of which is that they're highly controlled, they're very complex environments for humans to deal with and play. So we as humans think that if a person is playing chess very well, there must be some sort of notion of intelligence. You know, this 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 person must be intelligent, right? Even though people might argue that playing chess at the master level is not something very intelligent, right? Because hum because machines nowadays can do it better. So is that intelligent or, you know, are we intelligent if we play chess well? There's an ongoing philosophical um, debate about this. But um, just to move forward from uh, this brief history of AI uh, as associated to games, the main application area again, the main purpose was to build agents that play better than any other human. But what if we use AI in a different role when it comes to playing a game? What if we don't really care about beating the best humans, but instead what we care about is to test level, test games in a human-like fashion? Or, you know, basically use agents that they can explore, like this guy here, that can explore unseen levels that were just created by a human so that um, eventually the agent is finding some uh, you know, potentially finding some bugs or glitches in that level this is this is the ai engine that we use in uh, at model ai where you submit your game your level and then ai algorithms are covering the area exploring for possible glitches or bugs so moving from industry to research uh, when it comes to AI playing games. Um, this is another interesting example from my uh, PhD student, Sintan Trivedi, where he collected um, images from all these games that you see here from the sports genre, different games from each genre, like tennis uh, game, basketball game, and so on, throughout the history of the game. So you can think of basketball games with different style and different, different characteristics, aesthetics, and so on. Uh, throughout uh, you know the last 40 years for instance now if you think about it as a if you, if you plug in computer vision systems that they are they want to detect what sort of game we're looking at just by looking at the pixels of the screen what you care about really is that computer vision understands that this game is a tennis game and it has some core mechanics that game is a basketball game it has some other mechanics you don't care about the aesthetics. You don't care about the color, the RGB color. You don't care about you know the retro versus photorealistic sort of style. You care about what game am I, am I talking about? So if you throw all these frames through a pre-trained large model like ImageNet, you end up with this mess. So ImageNet or other pre-trained models are not capable of distinguishing between those genres, right? Uh, which makes a lot of sense because ImageNet is not trained on frames from games. But a very good idea is to use supervised contrastive learning and contrast the different genres uh, among them and thereby come up with a very good separation between the different genres. Why is that important? Because what we managed to do here with Sintan was to throw away the style 
and be able to use computer vision to detect that this particular game, independently of its style and its color, is a basketball game, which is really important because if you want to be able to play a particular or unseen game, you need to know what sort of game you're talking about. And then we took this idea a bit further and we looked at ways we could um, uh, basically understand core elements of a game from unlabeled data just by using the the power of a of a game engine uh, to augment data in a very particular way, we were able to detect really core elements of of uh, of a game like soccer or football. In this case, so how do we do this? Uh, let me ask you the question, like you know, the question that the a contrastive learning algorithm and a supervised contrastive learning algorithm is is um, needs to answer is to be able to find the view which is more similar, most similar to the anchor image. So you have an anchor image and you have some options. And then basically this image is exactly the same as this one with regards to the game state. So we are looking at the same game state, the same sort of frame of, of the football game, of the football match, but from a different camera angle, uh, you know, we have great scale, that one, uh, and so on. But nevertheless, it is the game, it is the same game state. So using game engines, you can augment your data with far more, uh, you know, better, th this, there's far more possibilities to augment your data. And as a result, doing so, you're able to automatically detect core elements of the game, like the position of all players or the position of the ball, right? So again, game engines offer this tremendous power of changing and augmenting data sets because you can change the camera, you can change the daylight, you can change the color of the of the pitch and so on in order to achieve this through unsupervised contrastive learning. And as it turns out, the, the method is quite general and robust across several types of, of games like first person shooters and racing games. Now, back to my question, what do humans do when they what do humans do in games? And then obviously in order to play them, they need to first design them. So yes, we humans design games as well. So you can think of ways AI can potentially design games. And then if you think about it a bit in more detail, then you will soon realize it's not a very easy problem for an AI to solve because games feature visuals, photorealistic or abstract visuals. They have sounds. Um, music and so on, um, sound effects. They have narrative, which could be dialogues all the way to books. They have levels with aesthetic properties and functional properties. And all of them need to be coherent. They need to be put together in a coherent way so that you can play it and enjoy life. And that is not really easy. If you think about it, that's not really a very easy task for an AI algorithm because of the, di of the differences that you're facing when it comes to you know, um, the, the data structures that, that you're dealing with here, the resolution of what you're trying to achieve, and the, you know, the synthesis of all these multiple facets of creativity that you see in games. Um, let me take you through a number of examples within the uh, procedural content generation domain or field, as we call it. So basically, the use of artificial intelligence techniques to generate content in games. And the first example comes from weapon generation in a first-person shooter. What you see here is here uh, are weapons that are generated by an algorithm we called surprise search, which is an evolution and computation algorithm inspired by our ability to, our, to surprise ourselves while we create things. So basically, it creates content that it surprises itself, right? It's, it's surprising to itself. And uh, all of these interesting weapons are that you, you will be able to see very soon are quite weird and surprising, and at the same time, are they are playable. You can just plug them into the game and they, you know, they, you can play with these weapons. So these weapons can, can serve as an inspiration for designers, or they can just, you know, you can just let the algorithm generate stuff for you, interesting weapons that you can select and, and use in a game. So speaking of inspiration and the interplay between designers and AI, Another sort of very popular area of research is what's called mixed initiative co-creativity, where you have AI taking initiatives during the design and you have a human taking other initiatives during the design. And then there's this creative dialogue between the two. 
So what you see here is a designer putting some on the left of the image. You see a designer putting some sketches or some sort of uh, indicative bases, indicative resources and impossible areas in a strategy map level creation task. On the right, you see some suggestions that are created by the AI colleague, um, optimizing particular objectives of the level, like you know balance and so on, and pushing the designer towards novel designs. So we, we have an algorithm called novelty search that actually pushes the designer towards unseen and quite novel orthogonal um, designs that uh, they haven't seen before. So yet another example of how AI can help humans design better games. Moving on, um, all of these ideas or you know, variants of these ideas have been transferred into actual games, commercial standard games that we all play. Most of you have seen Candy Crush, have played Candy Crush. Um, some of the levels that you you play uh, at this point might be generated by algorithms. So this is an ongoing collaboration with between Model AI and King, company behind Candy Crush, where we generate three match style um, levels uh, using a, a collection of algorithms from uh, from GANs all the way to evolutionary. Uh, algorithm, so some sort of combination between evolution and GANs. So, I mean, human creativity is is great, but it's limited when it comes to generating thousands and thousands of levels or creating like many hundreds of levels every week. So, it can only benefit from AI creativity as well or computational creativity. So, back to my question, original question: What do humans do in games? We design them, then we play them, and obviously, while playing them, we feel things. Right? This is what this is why we're playing games because we're having fun. This is a great experience. They offer great experiences, and as a matter of fact, this is the only interactive medium at this fast pace that uh, exists out there, and it's, it's it's the reason why it's so popular. One of the reasons. So we experience games while we play them. So what if AI could actually experience what how we feel, uh, and model that, detect that? So this is where games meet effective computing and player modeling as a field. So what you see on the left here is a collection of signals that we can get uh, from players like eye tracking, facial expression recognition, bio signals, and so on. On the right, you see some labels that um, some human demonstrations, let's say of effect or emotion that people have left for us. We might have those labels or we might not. In any case, in between, we we have an AI algorithm that learns that relationship. So one of the most popular approaches within affective computing uh, in general, non, not only in games, uh, is because, because, because essentially you would, what you're trying to do uh, to predict here is subjective labels of emotion, right? So one of the most promising, and uh, I would, I'm, I'm a bit biased here, but I, I would argue that it's one of the better approaches when it comes to modeling emotions, is to label them and process them in an ordinal way. So it doesn't really matter what the value of happiness is for this girl here versus this girl, but what matters is that, that she seems to be happier here than here. It doesn't matter what value we provide to a Likert scale or whatever, uh, what matters is the relationship between the two. Uh, what matters here is the relative change of arousal over time. And what matters here is the difference between arousal points that are given by humans. Now, if you do that, you, you end up with more general, more reliable and uh, more efficient models uh, of emotion. And one of these examples of, you know, one, one of these sort of case studies applying preference learning, uh, ordinal learning, let's say, uh, learning from ordinal data is this collaboration with Ubisoft where we collected with Ubisoft a number of gameplay data from this game called Tom Cluster Division, which is a first person shooter. On one end, we on the other end, we had some survey data from an in-house developed questionnaire. And then in between, we had some preference learning algorithms that would predict these four factors, presence, competence, autonomy, and relatedness, which are related to self-determination theory, right? And we basically give you a motivation profile for each, for each one of your players in your game. And this is really powerful because just looking at very few features of how these players are playing, like you know how many people they kill, how fast they complete the level, 
you're able to predict their motivation profile with very high degrees of accuracy. We're talking about like more than 80 or 90 percent in for some factors. It's really impressive if you think about it that it's so easy for us to predict how these people, how motivated these people are, just by looking at core uh, features of their gameplay. Obviously, that was not enough for us. So we wanted to take this research one step further, the research of understanding human experience in games. And we asked the question, what if, what if we don't have access to these features, like uh, you know, how often people shoot each other in a game or you know, how fast they complete a level? What if all we have is the gameplay footage and the audio that is generated by the, the game while we're, while we're playing games? Can, is that sufficient information for us to predict arousal or predict any emotional state out there um, with high accuracy? The answer is yes. So what you see here is four different games where we run a number of convolution, deep, deep convolutional neural networks that will just read the screen, right? Process the screen, the pixels of the screen, RGB color, and then we'll try to predict an arousal trace that is associated with each video. So we had hundreds of players playing these games, recording their video, and then asking them to leave a trace, an annotation trace, an arousal trace. How, you know, what was the level of the intensity of emotional intensity during the game? And we are able to predict arousal with very high degrees of accuracy. Like we're talking about like 80, 85%, which is quite impressive, just by looking at the pixels of the screen, right? There's no facial expression recognition. There's no user information. There's no bio signals, skin conductance or whatsoever. It's just like looking at the pixels and the sounds. And what you see next to each game is, an activa it's, is a number of activation maps, neural network activation maps. And uh, you know, red indicates at high attention areas, blue indicates low attention areas. So as you might be able to see, um, Neuro, the, the, the neural network that is able to predict arousal here focuses both around the areas of the player, but at the same time, uh, also at uh, elements of the user interface, right? So it's things like the score or the health bar and so on, which means that certain things are important uh, for the neural network to predict our experience. And that is not only just gameplay, but also what happens with the UI elements. And uh, because we're so excited about this research, we wanted to take it to the next level and uh, investigate to which degree this can scale to an actual commercial standard game. Because the, the games that I showed you before are sort of toy games that you can you could make in a, in the Unity game engine. But we're talking about what what you're seeing here is an actual uh, game that is you know it's Ubisoft game Ubisoft massive game called Tom Class the Division. And we're currently collecting all the data we can possibly can in order to test this hypothesis. So if you invite me next year, I might have more news for you. Um, along these lines, um, and because we were excited about all these results, we wanted to test another hypothesis of the generality of these models. So what if you have a very accurate model of player experience for a particular game? To which degree this transfer to another game of the same genre or to a completely new game, unseen game, or you know, of a different genre? To which to which degree it makes sense to ask the question whether um, you know there is artificial general intelligence within affective computing, or there, there is artificial general intelligence within emotion modeling, right? So this is what we're trying to test out by collecting this data set, which we call a game data set. It features nine different games and uh, more than 100 participants, nearly 40 hours of annotated videos. And it is available for all of you. The URL is not there, but if you search for a game data set, I forgot to include it. But if you search for a game data set, um, it is out there freely available for all of you. So try, try it out if you're interested in general effect modeling. Now, the next question we asked, uh, which is qu quite an exciting one, because it's um, it's a common problem of any uh, user study, any human computer study that involves a lab and then real life. So it's th the transferability of results and models that we build within a lab, within a computer or academic lab. And um, you know, to which degree anything that we make there and anything that we try to detect within the lab can transfer to the, to the real world. 
So think of, for instance, a game lab where you can collect all these different data from uh, physiological data, from sensors or from facial expression, and uh, you have a wonderful data set. And then you can predict the experience or the behavior of players with very good accuracy. But those sensors and those exotic stuff, that ex exotic stuff doesn't really exist when you go home and you play your game. So how does your model still work, still operate with decent degrees of accuracy? One idea was to bring the, no, the concept of pri privilege information from machine learning to affective computing. So traditional models use all modalities that they can find, and then they are tested with all modalities. But these modalities don't exist. So the idea is to train a teacher model and then a student model on the available modalities in the wild, and then transfer some information from the teacher model to the student model. And even though the student model that is in vivo in real life doesn't have information, doesn't have all the information required, it's still able to accurately predict what's going on because it has some sort of underlying embedded knowledge from, uh, from the teacher. So <clears throat> if you're interested in generally transferring results from the lab to the real world, you should check out this paper. Right, and um, moving on to something really recent. This, this work was presented like uh, yesterday, parts of this work uh, in a conference uh, at the IQ conference, a conference about affected computing, uh, the leading conference in that area. Um, what we're trying to do here is to uh, basically view affect modeling with uh, from a different lens, from an entirely different lens, from, from the lens of reinforcement learning. Because affective modeling in general is viewed traditionally as a process where you have some sort of input, some sort of labels, and then you learn between the two. You learn the mapping between the two. But oh, what if we treat this problem, we view this problem from a reinforcement learning lens? So what we did in, in this work by Matt Partet and others, Matt is a PhD student of mine, was to look at the state of the art algorithms in reinforcement learning. Um, and we, we found GoExplore, which is a fantastic algorithm for hard exploration problems. And we introduced, we basically implemented GoExplore for playing games, and but not only for playing games, for not only for imitating human behavior, but also imitating human experience. So you can think of having a list of a data set of human demonstrations of behavior on one end and human demonstrations on, of effect on the other end. And then you have a reinforcement learning algorithm that basically tries to play as well as possible or as well as a particular human and feel in the same way. So the result, the result is our agents like this one. These are generative agents that they were trained through reinforcement learning through Go Explore to imitate and feel like humans. And what you see here down here on, the, on these two graphs is the attempt of the AI agent to imitate human score behavior and at the same time imitate uh, a trace, an arousal trace that was, uh, that was demonstrated by this particular human. So again, here we have a number of, of, of games that were played, uh, racing games, and then the, their videos were annotated from, and this actually comes from the game data set, right? One of the games of the game data set. And then <clears throat> you have those agents, agents that can feel and play like humans, and then you can do cool things like this one. So you can have agents that basically, you can leave their play traces along the, the racetrack. And at the same time, you can color their play traces with emotion. So, and as you're able to see, there are some particular areas that are more intense than others, right? Like this, this part here. Right, so in the last part of my presentation, I want to focus on the application of AI and games within play, experience, and design beyond games. Like, wh where, is, where is that useful? Where, where is that, I mean, you know, why, how, why, why would one care about games after all? Um, well, let's, let's, let's look at that. Here's an algorithm uh, within the family of what's called quality diversity. This is evolutionary computational algorithms that they both maximize the quality of whatever they generate as a solution to a problem. But at the same time, they maximize the diversity of the proposed solutions. So you see this map here 
where it's uh, <clears throat> what we care about is the ground space versus floor space for an urban design task. These are the two dimensions we care about. And you see this map here gradually being filled in with potential solutions. And then, you know, the, the lighter the color is, the higher the quality of the proposed solution is. And you can see the various solutions being projected here for urban designers, right? So if you take this algorithm and you put it on the test on an actual city like Boston, for instance, then you have the city of Boston here with, um, this is the MIT campus area actually. So the gray, gray buildings are the MIT, blue buildings are residential areas. So what if you could, you know, demolish all, all the re residential areas and reconstruct them to maximize uh, the comfort levels of Boston citizens, right? Of uh, Bostonians. And this is the result of the algorithm. Applying arc elites, this is the algorithm to, uh, to the Boston MIT area. Um, as you might be able to see, there's like slight differences in what uh, how residential area should look so that we maximize comfort levels, right? I mean, we keep MIT intact. We didn't want to demolish MIT. Uh, similar algorithms can be applied for architects uh, in a creative dialogue, again, uh, between humans and, and machines, um, mixed initiative co-creativity, as I was talking about before, you can have an original sketch provided by a human and then the, the algorithm can suggest variations using quality diversity, then, the architect might sort of choose to move forward with more alter, art, alterations of, uh, of a particular design. You see a particular geometry of, of a building, of a villa here, right? And then once this sort of creative dialogue is over, then the architect can move in and, and look at, you know, how rooms are distributed in this sort of structure. So, so you already got the idea of how useful these tools are. And this is, this is, essentially what we're trying out here in, in this project, Prismark project, offering the architects uh, and even structural engineers uh, such solutions. And speaking of which, you can apply quality diversity algorithms for structural engineers. So think of, for instance, a structural engineer that thinks that, uh, you know, the average curvature of this sort of mass of the shape and the average height of the shape are really important when we design pillars for this structure, then the algorithm would be able to generate a number of different options that the structure engineer can pick from uh, along these two features. So this map that you see here varies these two features. So what is beautiful about this algorithm is that it, they illuminate the space, the design space and the feasibility space uh, you know, of possibilities here for the designer. And uh, you know, the fitness here, the quality here is like the energy of the building, how how structurally, uh, you know, the, the level of structural in integrity, basically, of the building. Moving on, you can do cool things with Minecraft, for instance. You can use algorithms that combine evolutionary computation and deep learning to generate novel buildings in Minecraft that they're feasible, they stand, you know, they're structurally uh, plausible, and um, yeah, they make sense, and they're novel. No one has, you know, no no human designer has ever thought about them. So now, yeah, this is this is this is actually the last part of the presentation, which is like one more example of what I'm talking about when I, when I refer to the symbiosis of AI and games, and uh, quite a few things to show you here. But I just selected one example that shows that sort of symbiotic relationship. You can think of AI that trains itself in a, in a game, and then you can think of a game that trains itself to challenge artificial intelligence even more. So there's, there's this sort of ongoing loop of, you know, both of us, AI and the environment getting better as, as time goes by. But instead of getting better, you can even think of it as two AIs interacting with each other um, and designing cool games. So you can think of an AI playing Super Mario, for instance, and another AI as a designer of Super Mario levels uh, in a creative dialogue. Um, and then <clears throat> the designer is observing how you play or how the AI agent is playing and is trying to meet some, meet, meet some criteria. And what criterion is that? Well, to maximize your fun, for instance. And now you might ask, how do we measure fun? Well, it's not an easy answer. It's not an easy question, actually. 
Um, so what we did was to go to the literature and uh, check this guy. His name is uh, Ralph Koster, and he came up with a wonderful uh, book about fun, the theory of fun, suggesting that fun equals to moderate levels of diversity in a game, just to put it very, very simply. So if you formulate that as a reward function, then you end up with something like this. Uh, you end up with a level that has not been designed for this particular AI agent, right? And then basically you can endlessly generate levels as much as you want that they're fun for a particular player. In this particular case, you have an AI agent that is playing in a quite boring way, if you ask me. But <clears throat> as you're able to see, the, the algorithm is generating alternating elements, maximizing the diversity or keeping a moderate level of diversity, actually. This is, this is what it does. So you can already see the, at least I can see the, <laughs> The quite, quite innovative, the, the potential, the innovative potential of, of such a as such a method for creating online in an online fashion environments for particular objectives, right? And not only for games, but for any any other environment that is um, that is out there that makes sense, right? So by now, I hope I have convinced you that games offer the final frontier for artificial intelligence research throughout the years, and that games. Are, and that AI, sorry, is the very next step for game development and game design through game testing, play testing, and improving experience design and so on. If you're interested more about this topic, you're welcome to read this book, AI and Games, from this URL. It's available for free. Uh, if you want to buy it, go ahead and do it. And if, you, if you're still more interested and you want to know more, then you're welcome to join us in this AI and, and games summer school that we organize on a yearly basis. Uh, it was just organized in Crete, but next year, who knows where that will be? It will be somewhere. We're still looking for options. And um, if you work, if you actually do research with games, please do consider submitting the best of your research to the Attributors Actions on Games. I happen to be the editor in chief, so I will welcome any, any cool uh, submissions to the journal. And uh, thank you so much for your attention. I will be available, obviously, for any questions you might have.